the Middle Eastern biblical description of the phonic alphabet's Phoenician root division into the many spoken language branches of the Semitic Middle Eastern language family tree describes it as having originally occurred shortly after the world flood that destroyed Atlantis, called in Genesis the city of Enoch. At the beginning of the Babylonian Empire, from the unification of northern Akkad and southern Sumer between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. In Genesis, we are told of the building of the Tower of Babel and of the subsequent confusion of the tongues. This mythology establishes the division of the alphabet into languages to the east of Babylon with the 50 letters of Indus, Sanskrit, and to the west with the 27 monoliteral hieroglyphics of Egypt, as having derived from the 36 letters of pre-Babylonian Ugaritic cuneiform. The earliest known antediluvial alphabets also known of including Linear A and B. No sooner than Sanskrit, hieroglyphics, and cuneiform could the runes themselves be dated. This is because, whether or not the menhirs of Europe were raised before or after the world flood, it is widely believed that the carved inscriptions on them, from which we date the eldest form of definitively runic alphabetic writing, could only have been etched into the stones after the flood, it is reasoned, on the grounds that they would have been worn away by the waters. Of course, this is inaccurate, illogical, and obviously wrong. Consider the Rongo Rongo writing of Easter Island. It was obviously written on them by the same people who erected the megalithic stone heads there. The fact that edifices such as England's Stonehenge differ from the upright but unhewn menhirs is demonstrated by the fact the menhirs are inscribed but Stonehenge was not. However, it is equally obvious that the same technique of aligning the sites to annual astronomical observations was used ubiquitously throughout. Contemporary and contrary to H. P. Blavatsky's proposal of the theory that the menhirs, henges, and megalithic heads were raised by the Nephilim, literally giants, of before the biblical world flood, Charles Darwin proved genetic characteristics could be used to trace the migration routes of species over epochs and of certain physical traits in races over the eras. It was because of Blavatsky's self-professed occultism that her theory came to weigh such heavy influence over Darwin's discovery, and why there remains now, some hundred years later, controversy on the issue of whether Darwinian evolution or Christian creationism should be taught in public schools. Darwin's original theory of genetic traits was, by the time Watson and Crick discovered the molecular structure of DNA, so polluted by Blavatsky's pseudo-mythology in the public mind that the discovery of light-skinned, red-haired mummies in Mongolia and southern Siberia, just north of the Tibetan Himalayas, led to such a swell of nationalist patriotism in Germany 
following the Weimar Treaty ending World War I, that it was successfully used to turn the public's eye blind during the Holocaust. In truth, from their origins in the Southern Hemisphere, Homo sapiens migrated in all directions continually, spreading from Africa and Australia into the Middle East and Southern Asia, and from there to Southern and Northern Europe, and to first the coasts and then the mainlands of North and South America. Throughout all these times, the biological language of genetics has migrated and dispersed throughout all these lands along with us. Thus, the notion of race should be considered a concept applicable only to ancient peoples of the past, such as the Blue, Aryan, Vedics of the Indus River Valley, the bald Semites of the Middle East, and the dark-haired Egyptian Africans. The even older Aboriginal and dark-skinned race should be considered the same in Africa and Australia. The idea of race should have ended with the Indo-European invasion of the Americas. By that point, the Indians had spread through China into the Siberian steppes, the Mongoloid race. While the Semites of the Middle East had migrated into southern Europe to mix with the race of Caucasians, who had migrated from northern Asia into northern Europe across the Caucasoid Mountains. The fact that the Proto-Caucasoid Asians were the Aryan Vedics of India and that the Proto-Mongoloid Southern Asians became the mainland North Americans should not be a matter considered on the grounds of race, but on language. In the same way, the Australian Aborigines and the African tribes people should be thought of as having once been two separate migrations of a single species that dwelt in Antarctica before it became glaciated during the time of the last North Hemispheric Ice Age. So we see the division first between the two routes of one species, followed by the division among the different early settlements of equatorial Eurasians of their formerly single language into various phonic alphabets, followed most recently by the notion of nationalistic root races, the so-called ancient feud between quote-unquote Aryan Caucasians and the Hebrew Semites having panned out into total xenophobia in the formerly European colonial North America has led from one degeneration and confusion to another, until finally all is chaos, and we forget the proper time of the coming of the next Northern Hemisphere Ice Age. But let us remember the original source of the runes, not as a written phonic language, but in the mythology of their own creators the Indo-Europeans. According to them, the runes were first seen by Odin in the reflection of the moon in a puddle below him as he hung upside down from Yggdrasil, the world tree of Druid mythology. It is far more likely the Druids created the runes to inscribe the menhirs and erected Stonehenge themselves. However, as I have now illustrated, the origins of the runes, as well as of many other ancient alphabets, remains as much a mystery as the origin of species 
so long as the creation of God is confused with the racism of its proponents. Although it is believed the inverted or unlucky crooked cross spiral motif was authentically a design of Adolf Hitler, it is known that the reverse of this appeared first on Tibetan Buddhist monastery wall paintings several hundred years before first appearing in Celtic Ireland. Both places, the Triskali, or Triple Cross Spiral, and the Swastika, or Quadruple Cross Spiral, are both considered symbols of the Milky Way galaxy as seen from above or below one of its poles. This symbol is also equivalent to the double cross spiral of yin-yang and hunab-ku. Similar symbols are the spiral and maze patterns that date back to the places of earliest habitations in Australia, Asia, Europe, and North America. So it should be considered an innate symbol in the original alphabet used in Antarctica. Its correct pronunciation, however, has obviously since been lost. Instead, now it is called Thule. That is why most post-Renaissance alphabetic forms have been retrograde to the trend of variegation and bifurcation. They attempt to simplify rather than complicate. This is occurring as the galactic cycle draws nearer to completing one full orbit around from the times of Atlantis in Antarctica. In addition to the self-styled theosophy of Blavatsky, the Nazis also adopted the rune lore of Guido von Liszt. Von Liszt had simplified the 24-letter Younger Futhark alphabet into an 18-letter alphabet he called Armenen. He created the shapes of these runish letters based on the refractions of light through such hexagonal forming crystals as quartz. A similar system has been more recently proven true for the letters of the Hebrew alphabet as shadows cast from the spiral shape of a ram's horn. While the Hebrew letter shadow shapes can account for the additional doubles or the finals, the idea behind von Liszt's Armanic system was to narrow down the number of runes as much as possible, and to that end, Liszt noted in his work The Secret of the Runes that the original runic alphabet consisted of 16 symbols in ancient times. The Armanen consists of some 18 intersections, all of which can be extracted from the six-line hexagon surrounding a central triple cross. In this diagram, from page 109, from Nigel Pennock's work, Magical Alphabets, 1992, Wiser. We see the 18 individual runes arranged in a regular pattern around the central hexagram, and that, in turn, surrounds the inner circle around the Cairo motif of early Christianity. At the bottom of the diagram, are given the 18 runes of the Armanen. In this diagram, 
we can find no particular significance to their specific order as shapes, and thus must presume their order as proceeding in the standard order of the younger Futhark. However, I would propose there to be a higher order of the insignia's placement than given by the standard phonetic ordering of the younger Futhark that can be produced as an alternative combination of the letter shapes on this same basic pattern. In other words, if the board is tiled differently, there would be more meaningful relationships between the shapes of the individual letters that would become apparent. However, the best way to deduce this would be to place a consecutive sized hexagonal quartz crystal on the center of the above diagram and then shine a light through it. The most significant aspect of the above pattern is the nascent combination of polar, cardinal, and zodiacal attributes. 2 plus 4 plus 12 equals 18. However, that much at least is inherent to the geometry of the hexagon itself and is not a byproduct of optical refraction gradients. It should be noted that the study of the Armanic runes of Guido von Liszt can be considered seriously now because of the mythology attached to it propagated by von Liszt's occult rival, Nazi SS Reichsführer Heinrich Himmler's mentor, Karl Maria Willigut. According to Willigut's mythology, the planet Saturn, home of the Hyperboreans, was a burnt-out star that was once the center of our solar system, the name of Willigut's mythological religion was Ermineshift, and Willigut himself was among the members of Ananerbi, the inner core of the Nazi occultists. Because Willigut distanced himself from the less radical von Liszt, we can now discuss our manic runes devoid almost entirely of all but the faintest taint of Hitler. It should also be noted, by way of discounting Ermanism, that the secret doctrine describes the spans of seven planets reigning as suns, the seven rays. Now, I'd like to show you my own pattern of arrangement for the 18 Armanic runes. Instead of being based on the inherent hexagonal shape behind each individual letter, thus rendering a circular arrangement, I have tiled the board with squares whose numbers and letters all correspond to those in the previous diagram. Here is my own arrangement of the Armanic runes. The reason for the placement of the phonetic letters on the squares is simple. The first six letters spell out F U D O R K, i.e., Futhark the name of the traditional runic alphabet. Therefore, they can fit across the horizontal row of squares in the middle. The six below and above then follow outward and from right to left. It should be duly noted, though, that this much of the ordering for my own version of the Armanic system is more or less arbitrary, open to debate, and subject to change for the better. 
The reason for the use of this particular form of arrangement of the 18 squares such that 2 to 4 to 6 to 4 to 2 equals 6 plus 6 plus 6 equals 18 is much more complex, however, and will involve other systems of runes as well as ancient languages from the entire early world. What we are about to begin embarking on is an unfolding of these diagonal diamond squares along a fractal pattern of expansion such that as the overall arrangement rotates one way the number of interior squares increases by counter rotating the other way around. However, before we can consider the next iteration in this unfolding and ultimately spiraling pattern of expansion, we have to come back again to the Elder Futhark of 24 runes from the more traditional circular arrangement. This diagram from page 121 of Penic Ibid displays the 24 Elder Futhark as each one a half hour mark on a standard base 12 clock. Note in this diagram that the interior most circle divided between light above and dark below would rotate fastest followed by the second circle out from that of the tides followed by the next circle out from that the 12 relative solar months per each year followed next by the outermost circle of the four cardinal zodiac signs of the seasons per eon then by the runes, then by the clock circle, and finally by the seasons surrounding the central circle of day and night. The circle separating the tide cycle from the seasons above day and night is four colors, gold, garnet, burnt umber, and drab olive, and represents Malkuth in a manner the Golden Dawn, called the Dragon Arrangements, that thus communicate the entire cosmic clock or moving calendar between the cards of Tarot, the so called Wheel of Fates. Having considered this model of measurement of cosmic spans of time, let us return to the unfolding diamond squares model I presented for the 18 letters of the Armenen of von Liszt. In the next diagram, I show the manner of interior redistribution of the letters as they occupy positions on a tiling board that has been rotated exteriorly by 90 degrees whereby each interior square has been rotated 180 degrees. The result is that the letters now proceed to wrap around the outer rim of the diamond square configuration overall, zigzagging in and out toward the central square and outward toward the medians of the diamond squares sides. So we see then, as the larger diamond square rotates one way, each smaller component diamond square rotates the other, and that as they do this, the entire system expands one way or contracts the other. This is actually due to a complex recombination method that I will explain in a moment. 
for now, suffice it to say that this diagram represents the 24 letters of the Elder Futhark in the same arrangement as my diamond square arrangement diagram for the 18 Arminen of von Liszt. The only difference is in degree and scale of complexity. In the 18 Armanic runes, we simply see a more concise and direct, less elaborate and complex iteration of the same model upon which the 24 Elder Futhark runes can be assembled. Now, there exists a further extrapolation of this unfolding system, comprised of 27 individual base unit diamond squares. I'll also return to describe it, but briefly in a moment. However, now let it be said that the runic alphabet of 27 characters that accompanies this diagram provides an additional level of discerning proper ordering of the individual components of the base 24 Elder Futhark arrangements seen here. Now, as to the table of correspondences that can be assembled on the base 24 lattice of the Elder Futhark in this unfolding arrangement, by comparison to the alphabet of the base 27 system above, and the base 18 system below may be derived a surprisingly wide variety of ancient languages later to become methods of divination. Considering the similitudes between the base 27 letter languages symbols and the eight double trigrams of the I Ching, I was able to establish in one system a correspondence between each of the 27 letters with an equivalently structured trigram and in a second system built into the first to place the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet that correspond to the 12 signs of the zodiac, the seven planets, and three of the four natural elements. I will leave it to the viewer to ascertain the order in which I have arranged these two systems relative to one another on the following diagram. However, be aware in that the central diamond-shaped ideograms, or diagonal squares, each relative to the larger overall diamond-shaped diagonal square pattern, and the I Ching trigrams, are the only things necessarily fixed to one another in this diagram. The Elder Futhark attributions stand as before, and my attribution for the order of the Hebrew and correspondent ideograms deserves revision, although still holding essentially sound as a rough working model. The process of folding and unfolding this model and the resultant interlocking yet obviously unique and each original forms of patterns among shapes that can be tessellated upon them is a way of unlocking the basic system by which all modern alphabets were created each being formed by derivation or extrapolation upon every other just as the three in four, the four in five, the five in six, the six in seven, in eight. So the twelve fit inside the thirteen, thirteen in sixteen, sixteen in eighteen, eighteen in twenty-two, twenty-two in twenty-four, twenty-four in twenty-five, 25 in 27, and so forth through 36, 50, 64, 72, 180, and 360. This is simply the material unfolding of a cube root 
diagonal from one corner to another, and even this is merely a point at the center of its shadow, the hexagon. In short, the base 18 unfolds into the base 24 via an intermediary state, the odd-numbered base 23. So too are 25 and 27 both odd number base systems and so both demonstrate a form of stretching out the space between the interior diamond squares whereas the structures of even numbered base units will always form a solid diamond square pattern the odd number base units will always form a vertical horizontal cross pattern that essentially divides the diamond-shaped square across its diagonals. Confer this model for a base 25 system arrangement as an example of how to begin constructing the base 27 model. From the base 27 model, the system of runes called the Agna arises.